Let's talk about the sword of the Roman Republic and Empire with my friend Gavin. Hi folks, Matt Easton here of Scholar Gladiatoria. So I've done some videos in the past talking about the Roman Gladius, but my friend uh, Gavin is visiting me today. Thank you, Gavin, for coming. Hello. And Gavin's brought some of his toys. So we're taking the opportunity to film with some objects which I don't have. And we've got here an Albion Gladius. Now, uh, this is a Mainz Gladius. We'll talk more about that in a second. And this is Gavin's Gladius. I'll let him hold it because it's his <laughs> sword. There we go. He gets the... I'm not holding the sword in my own video for once. So... Um, Gladii, uh, plural, or gladius, come up a lot in comments under my videos and people ask me how do I rate the gladius, how good is it compared to other swords, this kind of thing. So we need to put it in context. Um, now first thing to say about the gladius, and this is the real top headline that I want people to go away with, is that it is part of a unit. If I ask Gavin to pick up a scutum or shield, they are intended to be used together. Okay, and this is really, really important because if we try to compare just the gladius by itself with another sword, with a, you know, a saber or a rapier or a longsword or a viking era sword, it doesn't really work because we've got to consider the weapon set. So if I just leave Gavin there for a second with the shield and the sword, we've also got to remember, certainly for a lot of the um, imperial period, the pilum is also part of that weapon set. So while the Roman legions are famous for their use of the uh, shield and the gladius, in fact, we must remember that various forms of spear, either throwing spears like the pila, um, pilum or thrusting spears, were very, very important, certainly in the early days of the Republic, but even later on as well. And in fact, you could say that the plumbata is an evolution of that as well. So in the later imperial period, when you've got uh, multiple plumbata instead of or in addition to a pilum, that's a very important part of the weapon set. However, in close combat, I think it is fair to say that one of the, if I can just grab the gladius, one of the things which is most famous of uh, the Republic and the Empire is the gladius. Now, very briefly, diversion, where did the gladius come from? So first of all, you have the gladius hispaniensis. Now, a lot of people, I would say incorrectly, describe this as a gladius hispaniensis. In fact, we've got a fair idea that the gladius hispaniensis was a sword that came before this, and it was the sword that inspired this. And what it means is the Spanish sword. So, in fact, there was a form of Spanish sword that became the Roman sword. And this form that you see here is known as the Mainz Gladius. Um, so, there was also, most famously uh, after that, the Pompey Gladius. Now, these two models cross over in the middle of the first century AD. There was an overlap. And you do get something that's sometimes called the Fulham Gladius, which is sort of halfway between the two, don't you? Now, the Fulham Gladius is uh, not quite, if we just hold this up, it's not quite as uh, long and slender a point of this. It's generally not quite as broad as this. The Pompey Gladius, in contrast, has a, has a much shorter point and generally a narrower blade. And the Fulham's somewhere in between the two. The Fulham Gladius is called that because it was found in Fulham. The Mainz Gladius is typified by various ones that were found in Mainz in Germany. Fulham's in London, incidentally, and uh, the Pompey Gladius for obvious reasons. So, in the empire, in the sort of glory days of empire, the Pompey Gladius was most numerous. But some of you will have seen my video recently on the swords found in Israel. Now, there is some indication from there and from other sites that, in fact, the, uh, the earlier Mainz Gladius actually continued in use into the era of the Pompey Gladius, so there was a long period of overlap. Um, so, fundamentally, the Roman Gladius comes from the Gladius Hispaniensis, it went through the Mainz, a hybrid version that's sometimes known as the Fulham, and then into the Pompey Gladius. But that's the evolution of the Gladius most people know about, and probably, I guess, that's what you have yeah. mostly been told about the Gladius as well, Gavin. But where does it fit within a wider context? What were other people using at this time? Well, in fact, if we go to Palestine, for example, or if we go to Greece, or if we go to uh, Britain or Germany, we find different models of swords used. And there is a general tendency that in the south of Europe, shorter swords were being used. So sometimes a contrast is made between the Roman short sword, like it was a particularly special thing, as opposed to imagining that everyone else was using longer swords. This wasn't actually the case. So if we go back now to the Bronze Age, what we've got here is a Bronze Age leaf-bladed sword. And you'll notice 
they're not hugely different in size and weight and shape. Okay, and even with the Mainz Gladius, it's got a swollen blade on it as well, hasn't it? So you do get a degree of leaf shape to some of these, and it's thought that the Gladius hispaniensis had even more of that. And it's probable that there was some degree of uh, descent, not really evolution, but kind of ancestral descent all the way back to the bronze leaf blade. Um, so, um, first up, you've used this uh, Mainz Gladius, Gavin, um, quite a bit. What are your observations of it as a sword to use for cutting and all that kind of stuff? So, first of all, everyone assumes it's going to be for thrusting, and obviously that's what it's mainly designed for. You've got a very, very narrow point, and on the Pompeii uh, Gladio, you sometimes have a reinforced point. Um, so, thrusting is, is really what it's designed for. But we found during some tests where we were testing all kinds of different swords, from Victorian sabres, medieval swords, and this, that actually they're really good at cutting. Mm. Um, because you've got quite a narrow blade profile, it's quite stiff, it's quite wide, so actually you can get a decent cut on it too. So I suspect that although, as you said, it's context, everything's going to be about, I've got my big shield, and actually it makes sense that someone comes running in with their slashing sword to be thrusting, I think you can cut as well. Mm. Um, we think that the Romans were trained to mostly go for the face, neck, stomach, and then chest. Chest is harder because obviously you've got more protection there from your rib cage. But we think that they were trained particularly how to strike with the gladio, which is interesting. And we know that they trained against pels as throughout history. But yes, when we're using it, you can, the thrust is amazing, but actually surprisingly good at cutting as well. Yeah, and this is one of the other kind of misconceptions that I often encounter when I'm making videos on Roman uh, military equipment, is everybody is so keen to describe this as a thrusting sword. Mm. But as Gavin says, it is a really good cutting sword as well, just because people like Vegetius pointed out that they encouraged the soldiers to stab that by the very fact that he says that implies that some of the time they were cutting or at least the natural inclination was to cut as well but also as gavin said when you've got these large shields in use and remember it wasn't only the romans using large shields the gauls were also using large shields the britons various other people the germans if large shields are um present that actually kind of reduces the effectiveness of um, long slashing swords. So um, when we use longer bladed swords with smaller shields, like Viking era swords, like this Anglo-Saxon sword here, when you've got a smaller round shield, the legs and, and getting around to the leg or the head or even to the sides is a far more viable option than when someone has got a massive um, shield like this. Moreover, I would argue that cutting itself becomes harder when you're holding a massive shield yeah. like that. So actually using the sword primarily to stab makes sense against large shields to come around them, but it also makes sense if you're using a large shield. So I actually think that Vegetius was probably right. They yeah. did encourage, you know, just like Napoleon in the Napoleonic Wars, he told his cavalry to give point, don't sabre, don't cut. Mm -hmm. But that by itself implies that yeah, they were cutting, otherwise you wouldn't need to say it. The other aspect is if you've got a long line of shields, Thrusting is a nice linear movement. Cutting, you know, as we all know, yeah. anyone who's ever done sparring, you can cut behind you by mistake, all those kind of things, whereas thrusting keeps it nice. And, and that is an absolutely fantastic point. If you've got a load of people in a, in a, a shield formation, testudo, whatever, then, then swinging becomes very, very difficult, not just because of your large shield, but because of all of the other large shields around you, whereas stabbing is far more practical. I would also want to say as well that people talk about the gladius as if it was really really different for the time and as i said there particularly in southern europe if we look at greece for example you've got the xiphos now the xiphos has a clear ancestry to the bronze age sword that came before it and these bronze age swords these leaf blades they weren't the only type of sword around in in the bronze age we find long bladed broader bladed narrower bladed there are sometimes what are termed rapiers in the in the earlier bronze age period. So there's lots of different blade forms but this type of leaf blade is fundamentally in size, shape and use very similar to a Greek Xiphos, Xiphos. And that in itself is not very different to the Roman Gladius. Um, so I don't think it was a huge departure from what had gone before. Um, the Roman Gladius was part of a tradition and the Romans, I guess, adopted this particular form of Spanish sword um, but it wasn't hugely different to swords that were being used in Egypt, swords that were being used by the Greeks or uh, wherever. Now, if we just come forwards, uh, or rather northwards, um, to Northern Europe, we should mention the fact that 
there were long bladed swords being used in northern Europe and uh, the Celts, you know, the Gauls, the Britons uh, and the Germans were famous for using these longer bladed swords. Now I should point out this is not one of those, it's the closest thing I've got to it, um, but this is close to the long bladed Celto-Germanic swords that were being used in the north um, and they are very very different weapons. Now if I just ask Gavin to pick up the shield uh, and have the sword, um, if he forms into quite a close uh, close position like this where he's got the shield up and the uh, sword forward there. I'm going to have a shield of my own. Now the shields that were used by the Celts and the Germans varied. Some of them were quite small, like uh, bucklers almost. Some of them were a little bit more like Viking era shields and some of them were really big and long, probably partly copied in fact from Roman shields but the, the Gauls did use some quite large shields. But the fact is that the, what we read in the, in the books is the assumption that I'm going to come charging in to try and uh, take out the Roman and my slashes are going to be completely blocked by this massive shield here and my opponent is going to take me out with a nice tidy stab. Now this is what it seems from Vegetius and other writers, this seems that it's what the Roman legionaries were taught to do. I have always thought that the real key thing which gets overlooked is the fact that they were trained to fight as a unit in groups and this is even something that is covered in the Rome uh, HBO series. Yeah, really right. yeah. <laughs> so um, you know we've got to bear in mind weapons aside what was the most important thing to the Romans was their training, their organization, their selection, their fitness, their armor. Yeah. Armor plays a massive part here if you've got the Roman helmet and you've got a good um, coat of mail, hamata or plate, um, uh, segmentata you're usually more armoured than most of the people you're going to be fighting against as a Roman soldier. Although we should mention that some opponents they came up against, and the Gauls were a good example, often had male shirts and often had good helmets. So in fact against the Gauls, for example, they actually were coming against opponents who were similarly armed, even though they had longer blades, they were similarly armed and equipped. They probably just weren't as highly trained and organised as the Romans were. Um, but Coming back to the swords for a second, while we often talk about these Gauls and Germans that the Romans were fighting having long bladed swords, of course we know that the Romans adopted those as well. And that's the last thing to talk about the gladius. So if I just, well actually I'll use the, I'll use the Bronze Age sword. Gavin if you hold the gladius up, there we go. So a lot of people talk about this being the secret to the success of the Roman army. And it really wasn't. It was just a sword that they chose to use for a while for certain tactical reasons. But what did the Romans adopt after this? They adopted a longer bladed sword. They generally speaking moved to smaller shields, usually flatter oval shields, and they adopted a longer bladed sword correspondingly. So actually what we start to see is the beginnings of the early medieval weapon set, the long bladed sword and the large shield but slightly yeah. smaller than the Roman scutum, isn't it? So. And there are many reasons for that. We can maybe look at that in a future video. And your views on that are very welcome in the comments down below. But fundamentally, the Roman gladius went through uh, a series of evolutions. It didn't come from nowhere. It wasn't invented like some magical uh, kind of fix-all problem to all the world's swordly problems. It wasn't a magical <laughs> sword. It was a sword that was part of a tradition similar to swords that other people were using and very similar to swords that had gone before for hundreds and hundreds of years before it in size and shape, uh, even in different materials in the Bronze Age. And it worked well for a time and then warfare changed, equipment changed and they decided to move to a longer bladed Spartha. There was something that some people debate whether there was something called a, uh, a semi-Spartha. Uh, something between the Spartha and the Gladius, we don't really know. There's also some debate in academia about whether certain soldiers used the Spartha while certain others used the Gladius, we don't really know. Um, there's more research to be done on that, but fundamentally we know that long term, by the time you get to about the 4th century, if you look at a Roman soldier in the 300s, they don't really look any different to a Germanic soldier in the 300s. They've got similar-ish types of helmet, they wear male shirts, they use large round or oval shields to boss grip, and they use longer bladed Spartha. And these have a relationship with the migration era or you know, Anglo-Saxon, Frankish and uh, Germanic swords that we see that come after that. So, Gladius, great sword for the time. 
uh, but not a magical object and also not an isolated and special mm. object. It's to be used with a certain type of shield in a certain kind of way. And, and, that, and I was just going to say, maybe that's the strength of the Roman Empire at its at peak, is that they're very good at taking something that works, combining it with their wider arm system. So, right, we, we want a shorter sword, but it's going to work particularly with our shields and our training. And then as that became less useful, we'll look at the Spartha, we'll look at the Gaulish horsemen, yeah. and we'll, we'll borrow the Spartha. So I think their strength was looking at something, recognising that it was useful, and incorporating it into their systems. But it didn't work forever. And that's, yeah. I think that's one of the really important things. If you love the Gladius, that's fine. It is a lovely sword, and they do work very well. But remember that they fell out of favour. They were in the late Roman Empire, and as we go into the Byzantine Empire, they weren't really used anymore. They moved to the Spartha. They moved to the sword that was very similar to the sword that all of the other people in Europe were, were using at that time. And in our previous video that I did with Gavin, you will have seen him in his Lorica Segmentata with his lovely um, helmet. What are your thoughts about this sword used in conjunction with that armour and against that armour? So I think, first of all, a couple of questions that came from the, the last video was certainly around how much arm mobility you had in that Roman armour, the segmentata. And actually, with this sword, you get loads. So you can raise your arm quite comfortably if you want to cut, but also from a thrusting perspective, you're very safe. I think if you were wearing that armour against the Gladius, you would feel reasonably safe because you've got head protection and you've got body protection. Uh, and even your neck, unless they got a direct shot, would be, would be covered by a, a cloth or a scarf or something. But I think... Gladius, obviously, sometimes Romans fought against each other, and we know that through the civil wars they were using more or less the same equipment, so it must have still been effective against their armour. But having said that, as someone who's worn the armour and practised with the sword, I would feel quite comfortable wearing the, the segmentata and with the Gladius and shield, I'd feel quite comfortable. Yeah, and you know, Gavin makes an important part, point there that um, Romans weren't the only ones wearing armour, and, and a lot of people copied Roman style helmets, including the Gauls, and in fact, they themselves adopted uh, parts of the helmet design yeah. from the Gauls as well. And the fact is that armour was quite effective. That's why people wore it and invested huge amounts of money in it. And, uh, um, and as Gavin mentioned, the Pompeii style often has a reinforced tip, presumably for punching through male armour and making the tip stronger and less likely to break. If you happen to hit a helmet or a shield boss or whatever, you're not going to break the tip off because it's not fragile. It's kind of reinforced. And these were weapons of that time that were designed to bypass, like get into armpits and up into groins and stuff, or um, be able to survive contact and clashes with that armour. So you have to bear that in mind as well, and that could be part of one of the reasons that they moved later on to longer bladed swords, because maybe people have moved to types of helmet and types of armour, mostly male, where the longer bladed sword became effective again and, and slashing and chopping became, became favoured. But it could be a bigger, bigger thing than just weapons and armour. It could be to do with their tactics on the field, the number of soldiers, even ethnographic, kind of where they were drawing the soldiers from. Because we know in later Roman periods, they drew more soldiers from Germany, yeah. for example, who may have brought their own tactics and styles of fighting with them as well. Um, and greater use of cavalry, perhaps, uh, also. Yeah. Um, anyway, thanks once again to Gavin for bringing the Gladius down uh, and joining me. And I'm sure we'll be seeing Gavin in future videos. Uh, thanks for watching. Goodbye. Uh, take care and see you soon. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.